the study that we undertook of chapter 1 showed us that God in six days created out of nothing everything there is. And in most cases it says He spoke and it was so. And then after each day it says that He saw that His creation was good. As we come to the opening verses of chapter 2, which is our focus today, the first three verses describe the Sabbath. God rested on the seventh day to give us an example of what it would look like to rest one day out of the week for our uh, labors, from our labors. Then in verse 4, uh, Genesis 2 introduces us to more details about the people God created and some important specifics about the place He created for them on planet Earth. Verses 5 and 6 tell us that there was no rain on earth, but there was a, a moisture within the earth springing up from underground springs that kept the earth watered for this lush uh, greenhouse style environment underneath a canopy of atmosphere that was conducive for, for health and growth of plant life and animal life and life of humankind. Then as we move to verse number 7, where we're going to start today, we are introduced to several important details about what happened on day number six of creation. So in Genesis 1, we get the quick, brief summary of what happened on the sixth day. God created man and woman in His image. Then chapter 2 tells us and zooms way out and takes an entire chapter to tell us more about that man and that woman and that creation on that sixth day. Would you follow along while I start reading in verse 7? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put a man, the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, God, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Now verses 11 through 14 tell us about those four tributaries. And then in verse 15 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may, thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. We'll continue down in today's study all the way to the end of the chapter. But this chapter shows us God's design for mankind to live with one another and with Himself in the place on the planet that He created for our good. And I think one of the immediate things you see as you look at this passage is that day number six of creation, the day that Adam was created, was a very busy day for young Adam. He was created on that day. He spent that day getting to know God's creation. He was actually given the responsibility to 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 bestow names on every animal that was created. These animals were just a day or two old themselves. He underwent surgery. Recovered from that surgery, discovered a newly created woman, and got married. You talk about getting a lot done in one day. Busy day for Adam. But what this shows us is that God was very intentional in how He created man and woman and how He arranged for them to live. It's God's design. And God's design, it's like, it's like seeing the original blueprint for something. In this chapter 2 of Genesis, when you see God's original design, you see that, how that He created it in a way that humans could flourish. God designed mankind to flourish not only in their relationship with Him as God, their Creator, but also with each other in the place that He'd prepared. One of the great takeaways from today's message is that when we cooperate with and move with the grain of God's design, we are blessed. Life will be far from perfect on planet earth, but when we and where we cooperate with and lean into God's design with Him and with each other, 
there's a blessing in that because that's how He designed it for our flourishing. And wherever you find mankind or wherever we find ourselves fighting against, resisting, rejecting God's design, implementing our own design, and wrestling the reins away from the way God said things are to operate, it's kind of like a frustrating experience. It's an exercise in futility that we will never find satisfying because it's like trying to operate a complicated machine in the exact opposite way that its inventor designed for it to function. It just won't work. I want you to see the goodness of God over this chapter too. He provides mankind with a physical environment that's got a rich, lush supply of nutrients for him. He provides mankind a job to do, a responsibility to steward his creation. He provides mankind, and this is the most beautiful of all, access to himself. He provides mankind with moral boundaries. Moral boundaries are good in which to flourish spiritually. And he provided mankind with an opportunity to respond to God in loving obedience and fellowship. And so in this sec- the sixth day of creation, the second chapter of Genesis, we see four important facets of what it means on planet earth in God's design to flourish. And I want you to see, first of all, in verse number seven, the uniqueness of humankind. Humankind as God's creation is unlike anything and everything else that God created. Verse seven says, God formed man. That word formed carries the idea of of like a potter shaping a piece of clay into a piece of artwork that is the fulfillment of the potter's vision for that clay. That's what God did with mankind. He didn't do that with any of the rest of creation. It says He breathed into Him the breath of life. God's showing us here not only that He was intimately involved in our creation, so much of the rest of creation He just spoke into existence, but also that He has breathed into us something invisible, something beneath the surface, something on the inside that is described here as the breath of life. That breath of life, according to verse number 7, makes Adam and makes you a living soul. A living soul. There is a sense in which mankind is alive at a soul level that is unlike anything else. All of the creatures were alive. All of the animal kingdom that God created also on the sixth day and some on the fifth had beating hearts and breathing lungs in most cases. But in the case of man, he didn't just become a living creature. He became a living soul, alive on the inside, spiritually alive and able to interact with God. There's a, a spark, there's an there's a imprint, a fingerprint of God's image on humans that biology cannot explain and a laboratory could not replicate. We are both physical and spiritual beings and that separates humankind from all of the rest of creation. And it should humble us. And I will tell you, that's why when you study the history of civilization and societies all around the globe, no matter their religion, that you'll always find an awareness to a higher power, an awareness to something above them, something beyond them, something before them, because there's this awareness, there's this God-shapedness inside of us that really hungers for and is aware of a spiritual dimension, and it points us to Creator God. Paul understood this, and when he wrote to the believers in the city of Thessalonica, he speaks to this multidimensional man, human, and he says, I pray to God that your whole spirit and soul and body would be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You aren't a body. You have a body. You are a soul. As a created being in God's image, The spiritual dimension is part of what it means to be created in God's image. Augustine, centuries ago, said it this way, Lord, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. That's that God-shapedness that is this awareness to Him. It just so happens that this morning in my Bible reading schedule, I came across Ecclesiastes 3.11, which says, God has put eternity in our hearts. 
there is this eternal awareness, there is this eternal existence in our hearts that isn't in the rest of any of His creation. And nothing temporal, nothing earthly, no pleasure you experience, no possession you obtain, no position you achieve will ever satisfy the human heart without God Himself being in the middle of that satisfaction. Your capacity to know Him reminds you that there are questions without Him you don't have the answers to. And there is an eternity that without Him, you are not prepared for. We'll learn next week how that sin, which all of us have been guilty of, 100% of the human race, guilty of sin, how sin separates us from God and it breaks the relationship connection between mankind and the God for whom He was created to relate. But that Jesus Christ, if you fast forward, to the New Testament opening pages, you discover that Jesus Christ became the solution, the remedy, the redeemer, the restorer of mankind so that we imperfect, sinful ones who have broken connection with God can be restored through His connection to the Father through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. There is the uniqueness of humankind. And then secondly, in this passage, we see in detail the paradise of Eden The word Eden, the name of this garden, means delight. And it was truly a delightful place. Within God's glorious creation, there was this particular place where God demonstrated His goodness and His grace and His desire to bless and be generous with humankind. It's an early demonstration of His desire for our delight. Could you imagine that God wants to delight us with what He gives us? Now, we don't know geographically where this garden was, and I don't suggest you go looking for it. Verses uh, 10 through 14 tell us about four different rivers which flowed out of it. Now, we know geographically where two of those rivers are. We don't know where the other two are. All of this, those rivers and all of this garden were likely lost in Genesis chapter 6 at Noah's flood. But in this garden, there were two trees, we're told in verse number 9, the tree of life, that as Adam and Eve partook of the tree of life, they could sustain physical immortality and continually live, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what does it mean to say that this is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, Adam and Eve had never experienced and therefore had no knowledge of evil. They had no need to differentiate between good and evil because there was no evil on the planet. So they were completely innocent and there was no sin and there was no evil. And so can you imagine that? By the way, this is just a beautiful glimpse of what heaven will be like and eternity will be like for believers. No awareness of the presence of evil, not because we're ignorant of it, but because there is no evil. And I am thankful that on the final day in our redemptive work, in God's redemptive plan, we will be able to begin an eternity where evil has been completely eradicated and Eden will be restored in that sense that evil will be no more. Can you imagine Adam and Eve, the purity and the innocence of of not being, not, not even having a thought or a hint of any kind of a jealousy or envy or strife or bitterness or anger or violence or abuse or betrayal or just complete innocence. That's where they were. And this tree was in the middle of it. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. In verse 15, it says that Adam was given a job to do, to keep and to care for and to tend to the garden. This is a good little reminder for us that the work that we do is not a part of the fall or the curse, all right? Some of you are thinking, man, if it weren't for Adam and Eve bringing this curse upon the earth, I'd probably just sit around and watch the NFL network all the time. No, no. Speaking of the NFL, I saw a little meme this week that said this uh, coach of the Panthers, I'm not sure of his name because who cares about the Panthers, right? But this coach of the Panthers (laughs) got fired uh, a couple of weeks ago and someone said that his contract means that he'll be paid for the next two years Eight hundred and some thousand dollars to sit on his couch, and someone said a fired NFL coach is the best really gig you can get as far as a job. But I would say, based on Genesis chapter two, that no, having no purpose, having no job, having nothing to show up for, and to roll up your sleeves and apply creative energy to—that's not 
a great existence. Adam had a job to do. Adam was given the responsibility to steward this creation. And I would say that this is a little, bit, a little hint for us about human flourishing, that whatever it is God's given you to do, apply yourself. Now, it is true that the curse brought toil and the curse brought sweat. The curse brought busted knuckles on wrenches and the curse brought callous on hands and sweat from the brow and fatigue and disease. But the, but the work in and of itself is a gift. It's a gift from God to have a job to do, to have a place in this world where you're contributing to the good of society and to the good of your neighbors and to the advancement of God's glory in this world. So Adam was given an assigned work. But we see in verses 16 and 17 that there was one restriction. God said to the man, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Notice where God starts the instruction. He starts by focusing on all the wonderful things that they can enjoy and all of the many trees that they may freely eat, which by the way is a reminder that God's given you far much more to enjoy than what He has restricted you from. What is it about mankind? How many trees did they have? Hundreds, thousands? I don't know. There was only one. What is it about us that gravitates toward the one forbidden thing? But this this idea of God's commands and God having given a command shows us another way in which mankind was created in the image of God. Because Adam and then later Eve would be given the opportunity to choose righteousness, to exercise moral choice and to choose right and to do right over wrong. Some people always ask whenever you come to Genesis chapter 2, well, why did God create that tree? I mean, how good would life be had He not created that tree? The placing of that tree and the command to abstain from eating it were necessary if God would have the kind of relationship with men and women that He intended, a relationship defined by love. Because unless there's an opportunity to disobey, unless there's an opportunity to be disloyal, then the loyalty, the obedience, the choice to love doesn't mean anything. It provides an opportunity to worship and to give God the loyalty and the submission that He alone is due. Wiersbe says it this way, God wanted humans to love and obey Him freely and willingly, not because they were programmed like robots who had to obey. He made Adam and Eve in His own image and gave them the privilege of choice. This agency of choice is one of the greatest imprints of God's creation of us and is also our greatest opportunity, even though it is our undoing, it is our greatest opportunity to love and respond to Him in loving obedience and submission and glad, joyful acknowledgement of His role and of ours. It reminds me of what the Apostle John said in his letter to the believers when he said God's commands are not burdensome. But loving God and obeying God go together, John said. It's in your notes, 1 John 5, 2 and 3. We love God and keep His commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous or burdensome. God... Here's a little lesson for you from Genesis 2 if you didn't already know this. God will never restrict you from something that is good for you. God will never restrict you from something that will help you flourish. Anything that God said no to in these pages is there for your good. You say, well, I think there's some things I'd like to do and I think I'd enjoy doing it, but God says no, and so he's kind of you know, robbing me from some opportunity. No, no, that's the devil's duping of your thinking to give you that idea. No, no. God's commands are not burdensome. They're guardrails that are for our flourishing. There's, from a theological perspective, there's one more thing that this command did. It established God's authority over Adam. Adam and God were not equals. And Adam would know that. Adam was in charge of all of creation, but God was in charge of him. And God was his authority. God was sovereign. God was deity, not Adam. It is interesting to me to think about the heart of God <clears throat> because God knew, Scripture says, before He created Adam and Eve that they would choose to sin. 
and he knew and devised the means for the remedy for their sin, which was his son, Jesus Christ, slain on a cross on behalf of the rebellious humans. And God went ahead and created them anyway and went ahead and created that tree anyway and went ahead and gave them choice anyway, knowing what it would cost Him most of all. In verse 17, we see where God says, In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Adam and Eve died spiritually the day they ate the tree and they eventually died physically as a result and a consequence of having eaten the tree, which reminds us that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. We see in this passage the uniqueness of humankind, the paradise of Eden, and number three, the moment half the room has been waiting for, the creation of woman. In some of your minds, God's chiefest accomplishment. The creation of woman. Verse 18, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Isn't it interesting, that language? I think it's intentional. It is not good, because repeatedly, we're only one page into the Bible here, and what had the Bible said repeatedly in chapter 1? God saw His creation after day 1, and it was good. It was what? Good. God saw His creation after day number 2, and it was good. God saw His creation after day number 3, and it was good. And after 4, after 5, after 6, it was good, it was good, it was good. Chapter 1, verse 31, after all six days, it was very good. But here on the sixth day, in the middle of the sixth day, God says, wait, something's not good. What is not good? And I know what the women are thinking in this room. Men left unsupervised, not good. (laughs) I leave for a weekend, things go go to pieces, not good. What is not good, God? based on chapter 2, verse 18. Aloneness is not good. Aloneness. Isolation is not good. Adam, after having seen the wide variety of animals, understood his own incompleteness. Imagine God marching in front of Adam every kind of a creature that's in the Detroit Zoo and every other zoo that ever was all of the different varieties of the animals, and, and Adam saying, you know what? None of them quite do it for me. You know, um, This is beautiful. This is great. But I still feel like maybe there's one more thing that's missing. I can't put my finger on it, Lord. It's not good. And Adam understood that he, though mankind is the crown jewel of God's creation, humankind. Adam understood that he is not self-sufficient and neither are you. We need companionship. This is not a lesson just about the value of marriage, although there are some applications there. This is a larger message about the value of companionship. Thriving spiritually, flourishing as a human is not done alone. It can be done single, but it won't be done alone. We need others in our lives. Now, I know there's many of us in this room that would say, I enjoy walks alone in the woods, silence and solitude. I enjoy that, and I I do too. And that's a great opportunity for prayer and meditation. Some of you, it's a great opportunity to sit in a tree stand and wait for Bambi to come by. that is a blessing, that aloneness, but only so that you can have a healthy soul and come out of that tree stand and out of those woods and re-engage the people that God's put in your life whom you need and for whom you were designed for and whom were designed for you. This is why here in the New Testament age, the church is a beautiful piece of God's design that has the roots of its theological value all the way back in chapter 2. It was not good that you should be alone. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. There are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor can the head to the feet, I have no need of you, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble or weak are 
necessary. Here's what God says about the church. It's necessary. Here's what God says about relationships. They're necessary. There also is theologically here a lesson about the fact that it took both sexes, male and female, to adequately demonstrate the beauty and the glory and the creation of what it means to be made in God's image. And that we are not self-sufficient without one another in each other's lives. Again, that might not mean marriage for all people. Jesus was never married and was the most complete man to ever walk the earth. Paul was not married. Jesus spoke about the gift of singleness. And so you can be single and complete, but you, and you can be married or complete, but what you can't be is complete without other people in your life. And there is a war between the sexes that has raged probably for generations. And it's often the fault of both sides, viewing each other cynically and critically. You have on the side of the male species, misogyny or chauvinism. You have on the side of the female species, some forms of modern feminism. And there is this rebellion against God's design that says you need each other and you ought to live in harmony with each other and you ought to relate to each other in ways that reflect my design. So God performed surgery on Adam. <clears throat> Verse 20. God gave names to all the cattle, but for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. What an interesting expression. A help, or your Bible might say um, helper. Meet, or your Bible might say uh, corresponding to or suitable to. The idea here, the, the word picture that's painted is, is not a word picture that gives any kind of an inferiority whatsoever. Sometimes people hear the word help me or the word helper and they think, oh, that's, that's trying to kind of make women sound inferior. Oh, no, not at all. In fact, God calls himself a helper. The, the idea of the word helper is this is someone who meets the needs of the other one who's in the equation. This is, and, and we meet each other's needs. And Adam was created first, but he was incomplete without a companion. And so here, the, the, the woman is created as the counterpart, as the completing part, as the other piece of the puzzle that fits correctly. That's what the word helper means. Psalm 30, verse 10, Psalm 54, verse 4, God is referred to as with this same Hebrew word that is translated helper. It's a glorious word. It's a beautiful word. It's a word that describes the idea that this person brings great value into the life of the one they're being brought into. It is to, it is to say that Adam had a corresponding peace that met the great need of his life. And so God performed surgery. And God created two humans that were equally valuable, but purposefully different. Someone said to me, some female said to me, Pastor Tim, what did God say after he formed Adam? And I said, what? And she said, I can do better than that. <laughs> the heresy that sometimes comes <laughs> from the mouths of the spiritually immature. Uh, look at verse 21. Uh, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. That's the first anesthesia in the Bible. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh. By the way, this is the first miraculous healing in the Bible. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made, and from the rib, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. Matthew Henry is probably the best-selling Bible commentator of all time in the English language. He wrote his commentaries in the 1800s, I believe. And Matthew Henry, I have them on my shelf, and Matthew Henry said this, she was not made out of the head to rule over him, nor out of the feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. The Bible's message about the difference between the sexes is not some archaic, uh, old-fashioned, uh, ignorant depiction. No, no, no. It's a beautiful, timeless, eternal, divine design that has made two different and unique uh, individuals who are distinct individually and designed differently 
many of the ways they were designed overlap, but there are ways in which they are distinct. And those ways in which they are distinct, life is more beautiful because of it, relationships are more rich because of it, and life continues on planet Earth because of it. Men are equipped by God for the role of men, and women are equipped by God for the role of women. That's the creation of woman. And then we find in the closing four verses of this passage, the establishing of marriage. The establishing of marriage. As I said, in God's good plan for individuals, it is not His good plan that all people are married, but it is for many, of course. It is God's will that all people have companionship. But for those whom it is God's will to be married, we see here a pattern, a beautiful pattern. And this is something that uh, even those unmarried individuals should value because it is the it is the building block of generations, the building block, therefore, then, of society. And the first thing we learn from verses 20 through 25, through 25 is that marriage is a sacred thing invented by God, which functions under His authority. So the government can make up whatever kind of silly rules they want to about redefining it, but God is the one who invented marriage, and His governing of marriage doesn't change. This passage, verses 20 through 2 through 25, was quoted by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Apostle Paul. Now that's interesting because Jesus quoted the Old Testament often, Paul quoted the Old Testament often, but nowhere did they both quote a more lengthy and specific passage with greater detail than the passage you are about to read, verses 22 through 25. Apparently Jesus believed this passage and Paul did. And these verses reveal to us the purposes of marriage and the principles for marriage. First of all, look at verses 22 and 23 about the purposes of marriage revealed in the first wedding. Verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Picture this. It's a beautiful picture. He brought her to the man. Imagine that Adam is waking up from anesthesia and God brings. Eve into his presence. And what Adam does in verse 23 is erupt in poetic praise and gratitude. It doesn't come through necessarily in the English language, but Hebrew students will tell you that there's, there's exclamation in these words. There's, there's praise in these words. There's poetic beauty in these words. When Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Someone said that when Adam woke up and God brought Eve to him, the way she got her name was that the first thing Adam said was, whoa, man. (laughs) Seems fitting. Actually, the, the word, the Hebrew word and the English word means from man. Uh, why did God do all this? Is there a purpose revealed in marriage here? There is. And if you study the Scripture, you'll find three purposes to marriage that that have their seeds in these verses. Uh, First of all, marriage exists to complete each other as companions. Again, uh, you can be complete with companions without being married, but in the case of a marriage, it is one of the ways in which God completes another individual. Most married people in this room could probably identify an area where maybe they have a weakness and their spouse has a strength. Or more rapidly, they could think of an area where they have a strength and their spouse has a weakness. And they correspond to each other. I can't tell you the trouble I've stayed out of because I'm married to Nicole Christensen. There's weaknesses that are balanced out by the spouse's strengths, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, Most uh, spouses are aware of that. Think about how Adam welcomed Eve into his life. It's a picture of how every spouse should receive their spouse as a gift from God. Adam didn't know what skills she might have on this day. Adam didn't know what she might or might not do for him or with him. He hadn't even been romantic with her yet. And yet he celebrated her arrival into his life, which gives every spouse a little glimpse of the disposition you should have toward your wife and why uh, or your husband. Why? Because why did Adam celebrate? 
He didn't know anything about Eve. You know what he did know? He knew something about God. And he knew that this was a gift from God that he knew in his soul he needed and was missing. And so I want to challenge you, whether your spouse is real close to perfect or real far from perfect, if you believe in the providence and sovereignty of God, you ought to embrace the idea that this is the person who God has brought to me. And because of God's goodness, I can flourish with this person. And you say, well, man, our marriage is a wreck. It's filled with a a couple dozen or several dozen uh, dysfunctions. All of those can be dealt with and overcome with time if it's built on the foundation of God gave me you. Adam was eager to receive who God had given him. It also gives you a little lesson about looking beyond your desire to change your spouse. You don't need to change your spouse. Your spouse is being worked on by God. And, and sometimes you interrupt God's work in their life because you try to wrestle the tools away from Him. But accept your spouse as God's creation for you. So that doesn't excuse sin, by the way. That doesn't excuse wrongdoing. Uh, and it does take two for a marriage to function. I have great compassion and have prayed often for people who are doing their dead-level best to approach their marriage just as God would want them to and are married to a spouse who refuses to do so. Actually, Paul addressed these precious folks in 1 Corinthians 7, and he told them that, that there was grace and compassion and mercy for them and that if their spouse departs because of an unwillingness to cooperate with God's design, that they uh, can sleep well at night knowing that they've done their part. But that is the first purpose of marriage, to complete each other as companions. Secondly, to multiply a godly legacy. Uh, God created men and women to procreate, to have children. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. One of the ways God wants to multiply generations of men and women whom He can love and upon whom He can pour out His grace is by putting mommies and daddies together and having them bring up boys and girls who will learn to know and love and follow and fear and worship and obey the God that the mommy and daddy love and follow and obey. The third purpose of marriage is to reflect God's image relationally. The Bible teaches, especially in Ephesians 5 and elsewhere, that every Christian marriage is intended by God to be used as an object lesson of what agape love looks like to a lost world who needs God's love. God's desire is that the people who watch you do marriage with your spouse, if you're a Christian husband or a Christian wife in this room, that God's goal is that the people in this world would watch you exercise enduring love, sacrificial love, forgiving love, restoring love, patient love, sacrificing love, and in seeing you that they would get a glimpse of a variety of love that is so far above what this world has to offer on movie screens and in greeting cards. It is the kind of a love that points to a divine creator and redeemer who loves them. God's character is revealed through you. Then we see in verses 24 and 25 the final two verses of the passage, the principles for marriage. These verses are actually, verse 24, excuse me, is not a story of the creation. Verse 24 is Moses' comments from God through him to Israel about this first marriage, okay? All of this passage is about Adam and Eve's wedding. But verse 24 is Moses' comments about what this means to believers as they think about their marriage. Verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. There are three principles baked into that verse. First of all, the principle of leaving your parents. When a, uh, a wife leaves her mother and father, and a husband leaves his mother and father, 
and they come together in marriage, on that day, in that moment, a new household is formed. There are apron strings that are cut, and the allegiance and the dependency is shifted from the nuclear family in which I was a member to now the new nuclear family which I am helping to establish. What, a, what an important shifting that is for every husband and every wife, leaving the, the parents and cleaving to the spouse. Cleaving is a good old English word. Cleaving means to become one or to stick like glue. It means two things come together as one. I'd like you to hear Dennis Rainey's comments on this idea of cleaving. He uses the word commitment to describe it. And he says, commitment is an unbreakable pledge of fidelity and devotion. It is the unconditional, irrevocable promise to always be there. It is the resolute conviction of your will to stick with that person for life. When you display that type of commitment in marriage, you become a witness to the world of God's unconditional commitment to you. And this unconditional commitment creates an atmosphere of security in the marriage. The more committed a spouse knows that their spouse is, the more secure they are, and the more they will lean into the relationship. Now, let me just say this for those who have suffered through divorce in this room. Again, divorce is a tragedy, but if you've suffered through one, God loves you, we love you, we're glad you're here. It doesn't define you, and God has grace and mercy for you. And in fact, some of the most godly people I know are divorced people who are members of Bible Baptist Church. Some of the most loving husbands and loving wives I know are people who have been given by the grace and mercy of God a second chance at marriage, and they are living out those vows that in most cases, in the circumstances that I'm aware, they tried to live out with someone earlier, and the other person was unwilling to continue with the Christian commitment of marriage. But they did their best, and now... They suffered through that tragedy. God gave them great grace. God gave them great mercy. Divorce is the result of living in a broken world and rubbing up against broken people. But now God is doing a work in their lives. And, and I just want you to know, often um, the, there is great guilt and great ostracization that comes with having walked through divorce. And I just want you to know, you'll never be met with that here. And that what you'll be met with here is grace and mercy and companionship from brothers and sisters in Christ who will walk beside you with good faith and the benefit of the doubt that you've done everything you possibly could do. But this is the pattern for marriage. And we would do well, especially as we raise up another generation of young men and young women, to make sure that we communicate this to them. And then the third principle found in verse 24 is the becoming of one flesh. The becoming of one flesh. This, idea is, this, this, this carries the idea of intertwining two lives together into one. Remember in the first portion of this message, I talked about God creating Adam, and, and at the inside of Adam, at the deepest part of Adam, the recesses of his life was this soul that could know God and that had a depth to it. That's what marriage is supposed to unite. The sexual union in marriage, which this describes, and which 20, verse 25 also beautifully describes, the, the, the physical union in marriage is but an object lesson. It is, a, it is an important piece of marriage. It is a beautiful piece of marriage. It is a needed piece of marriage. It is an enjoyable piece of marriage, but it is only an object lesson of the greater union that it illustrates that occurs at a soul level. And that becoming of one flesh is an experience of oneness, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, that beautifully creates something that only God can put together. What do we do with Genesis chapter 2? I think we look at Genesis chapter 2 and we say, okay, God knew what He was doing. And as we cooperate with what God designed, we're blessed. And as we try to rebel against what God designed and go against the grain of what God intends, we will find ourselves frustrated and filled with 
unnecessary friction of sin in our lives. We are creatures made in the image of God to exist, to enjoy the multiplied blessings from the hand of God. And so it is a tragedy to live, apart, live your life apart from God and living in a direction that is away from God because what we do know is this is a complicated world. It's hard enough to live in this world with the Lord's grace and help every day. How, how futile, how frustrating to live a life wandering and confused away from God when we can be the children in our Father's world. This is my Father's world. That's what the old camp song said. This is my Father's world. And we do well to lean into the wisdom that He gives to thrive and to flourish in it. Maybe today you're going to pray for yourself or the next generation. Maybe today you'll pray for grandkids. Maybe today when we pray in a moment, you'll actually ask God to forgive you and help you to bring an area of your life back into line with His design so that His blessing may rest upon it. Or maybe today you need to begin your relationship with God because your relationship with Him has been broken by sin and now you need to come back to Him through repentance and faith which is available to you through the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross on our behalf to make amends so that our sins may be removed from our lives and we may come into a relationship with God through His merit and His grace not through our own. Our sins can be washed away. Our sins can be removed from our record and we can be made right with God through Jesus Christ. If that's your need today, when we pray about these other things, maybe you'll pray about that. Maybe you'll ask God to save your soul and maybe you have questions about that. I'll be available. Others will be available afterwards. We'd love to get those questions nailed down and to help you cross that line of faith in Christ before you even leave this room or this building today. Could we bow our heads together in prayer? Lord, thank you for the opportunity to um, consider your good design. Thank you for creating us. We're humbled by it. To think that we can lift these voices and use these minds and know that there's a God above us who created us and whom we can know and who knows us. We're blown away by that, Lord. We take it for granted sometimes, but we're humbled by it and grateful for it when we think about you breathing into us the breath of life and making us a living soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for this creation. Thank you for marriages and families, and thank you for provision and companionship and the church. You've been so good to us. All of us are carrying burdens and see all around us the effects of sin, but we'd all have to be aware that just the ability to know you and know who you are and relate to you and know that we could have a future with you is something to, to spark great gratitude and great joy in all of our hearts. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us first. You are the creator. We are the created. Would you keep your heads bowed for a moment and as the music plays, just speak to the Lord in prayer. Maybe you'll pray for your children or your grandchildren or your own marriage if you're a married individual. Maybe you'll ask the Lord to forgive you for some area that's out of bounds. Maybe you'll ask the Lord Jesus to save your soul and bring you and lead you into a restored relationship with the God who created you. If you have questions about that, I hope you'll speak to me or one of our other pastors or leaders afterwards or maybe you'd write us a note on the connection card or send us a message online if you're watching online. We'd love to follow up with you and have that all-important conversation, even today, about knowing God personally through Jesus Christ.